You know, I love JRPGs. However, sometimes these JRPGs get less than stellar reviews. Here are 10 JRPGs that got negative reception that I really enjoyed. The JRPG genre is full of games for everyone. Some are loved, but others get awful reviews that almost make them seem unplayable. I've heard it through all of my years of gaming. Why are you playing that game? I thought it was terrible. These games that get negative reception though, are they really as bad as people say? Today I want to talk about 10 JRPGs that got a bad rep that really were quite enjoyable and I was glad I gave the chance to. We'll talk about what the critic and user scores are according to Metacritic, what earned it those scores, and why I enjoyed the games. Before we get started though, keep in mind that this is just my personal opinion and you may still think that they're awful, and that's okay. But have you ever played a game that got bad reviews but you really liked? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, I'd love to hear all about them. With that being said though, let's get to discussing 10 JRPGs that I enjoyed and don't deserve the slander that they're given. Infinite Undiscovery released on September 2nd, 2008 for the Xbox 360. Infinite Undiscovery is commonly hit with criticism every time it's mentioned. With a user score of 7.2 and a Metacritic score of 68, it definitely was received terribly by critics and mm, somewhat average by the general community. Common criticisms are usually ranging from generic music to a clunky battle system, awful voice acting, and just terrible mechanics through and through. Honestly, I personally don't understand the hate that this game gets. While I will admit that the combat can be frustrating at times and the voice acting is comical, I really enjoyed the music and I had a lot of fun with the exploration and gameplay. While it can be frustrating, it gets better the further that you progress in the game, even if that clunkiness never goes away. My enjoyment of this particular JRPG could quite possibly be because I absolutely adore Tri-Ace and almost everything that they put out, so while I might be biased, I still feel it deserved more love than it was given. It's a shame that this game hasn't been ported to modern hardware, but at least it's playable on a Series X through backward compatibility. I'd like it to be better as far as accessibility, but this is better than being entirely lost to time I suppose. Breath of Fire Dragon Quarter, released for the PlayStation 2 on November 14th, 2002. With a user score of 6.3 and a meta score of 78, it isn't a surprise that this game almost killed the series. Most of the complaints of Dragon Quarter stem from the fact that it was an incredible departure from what Breath of Fire was meant as. No longer is it a standard turn-based RPG, it now is more of a dungeon crawler and has really sluggish combat and the combat you're better off avoiding with the way that it plays. Another criticism is the fact that you are meant to play it several times, with the demeter system that when emptied ends in a permanent game over, resulting in you needing to begin the game from the beginning with all of your stats. Personally, when I played Breath of Fire Dragon Quarter, I didn't have any history with the previous four games in the series, so I went in with a completely fresh mind and thought the game was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the fact that it's meant for multiple playthroughs where you progress a little further with each playthrough. I'm sure if I had grown up with Breath of Fire, I probably would have been just as disappointed with the game, but I enjoyed it since I didn't have anything to base it off of. I never actually finished this game though. It's a huge time sink and the mechanics were a little bit complicated. I think I dropped it around 75 hours, but part of me wants to go back and start the game all over again and give it a fresh look now that I've played the first four Breath of Fire games. Great idea, or is that just a huge mistake and I should avoid it for the rest of my life? Final Fantasy XIII, released on December 17th, 2009 for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and later in 2014 for the PC. With a user score of 6.3 and a meta score of 83, and even lower with 65 on PC, I was shocked. I honestly expected a much lower score. This game gets way too much hate, though I can see why people might be against it. Common criticisms you see are the dungeons are hallways, battles can be completed by just spamming auto battle, and the leveling system is restrictive, only letting you level up to a certain point per chapter regardless of how much fighting you do. Don't even get me started on how much people seem to hate hope. Another thing I don't get. 
Myself, on the other hand, I adored this game straight from day one. The game is gorgeous graphically even to this day, and I just had a blast around every corner of it. The music was fantastic, the characters are wonderful, yes I even like hope, and I really love the battle system. Being someone who loves job systems, having a battle system where it's encouraged to swap jobs for your entire party at once on the fly was perfect for me. I'm still waiting for the day when Square Enix decides to give us a collection of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. As of now, the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy are the only games in the Final Fantasy series that are not playable on PlayStation 5, save for Final Fantasy XI. They're not only playable on Series X, but if you play Final Fantasy XIII, XIII-2, and Lightning Returns on a Series X, it's basically a remaster. At least it's available to play there, but I would love to have it on PlayStation 5 where I've played every other Final Fantasy game up until now. Arc Rise Fantasia, released for the Wii on July 27, 2010. With a user score of 8.3 and a meta score of 64, it appears that gamers loved it much more than the major review outlets. Arc Rise Fantasia generally has two main complaints, the first being the difficulty. It's incredibly unbalanced, which affects the enjoyment of the game, and the second, well, let's just let this clip explain it to you. Ah! Help me! I don't want to die! Help me, Mr. Lark! Yeah, the voice acting. Arcrise Fantasia is commonly mentioned when the topic of awful voice acting comes up. The only game I can think of that has worse voice acting than this is Chaos Wars, but we don't talk about that. I absolutely adore Arcrise Fantasia, it looks wonderful with its cel shaded art style, and the combat is a lot of fun, kind of reminding me of the AP system from Skies of Arcadia. Honestly, with the voice acting, I'm a weird being when it comes to bad voice acting. If a game has absolutely terrible voice acting, it honestly interests me more, because it gets to a point where I just want to get to the next story scene so I can see just how much worse the voice acting can get and it raises my enjoyment of the game. I don't expect realistic voice work when it comes to JRPG. No anime or JRPG character ever talks like a normal human being, so I say steer into the skid and make it sound as ridiculous as possible. That being said, I hope that we get a remaster of Arcrise Fantasia, even if Imagey Poach is closed now, because I would love a way to play this game again. Tales of Symphonia Dawn of the New World, released for the Wii on November 11, 2008. Oh man, I can almost hear people now. People lighting their torches and readying their pitchforks. With a user score of 6.1 and a meta score of 68, I feel like I'm one of the only people that actually enjoyed it and had more fun with Dawn of the New World over the original Symphonia. So why don't people like the sequel over the original? First of all, the combat took a step back and feels much more clunky than the original. And Emil. People hate Emil because he's whiny, weak, and is apologizing on a constant basis even when he shouldn't be. Well, I can understand people hating a whiny main hero, I feel this is perfect for his character. Seeing his parents murdered right before his eyes as a child is going to traumatize and have an effect on a kid's entire personality. In addition to this, the world map was removed and the original Symphonia characters while playable, are level locked and cannot get stronger outside of farming for stat increasing herbs. All of this resulted in the game getting some pretty rough reviews. This is a shame because I really enjoyed the game and I've played through it several times at this point. I really liked Emil and Marta as opposed to the original cast, even if Marta is a creepy stalker who would brutally attack anyone who even looks at Emil with romantic intent. I liked being able to raise and evolve monsters to fight for me and just the overall story, I found it more enjoyable. I'm still annoyed that Tales of Symphonia Remastered didn't include this game like Chronicles did on the PS3. I'm still hoping that we get it at some point, but I'm starting to lose hope. Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness aka Star Ocean 5 released on June 28th, 2016 with a user score of 6.4 and a meta score of 58. I can totally see why people dislike this game. Everything in Star Ocean 5 got toned down. The item creation is simple and bland. The combat is chaos, letting you have every single party member in battle at once. And the exploration is non-existent and includes 
insane amounts of backtracking. And the worst offense of all is that for a game called Star Ocean, you do not once have any space travel. Instead, you run around on one planet by foot. And lastly, this game is short. Like, you can play through the whole game within 20 hours, 25 hours if you want to do the post game. So if this game is so terrible, why did I enjoy it? Honestly, I mentioned it before, but it's Tri-Ace. Tri-Ace just has this feeling that just reminds me of my childhood. Is this as great as games like Star Ocean 2 or Valkyrie Profile? Oh, absolutely not. But it still has that sense of familiarity. And I love the fact that item creation in Star Ocean games lets you create some equipment that just turns the whole game into a cakewalk. Though, I still do have some criticisms for the game, such as the way cutscenes are portrayed, they just don't look like cutscenes. Sure, the very important ones look like regular cutscenes that you'd see in any kind of RPG, but the majority of them just look like idle banter. Such as when you enter a town, you'll be forced to only walk slowly, but your party will be conversing back and forth. I missed quite a bit of actual story because it doesn't seem like it's important when it's done in this style, it just seems like casual conversation. That being said, I enjoyed it. Is it my favorite game in the series? No way at all. But it's still enjoyable enough to kill a weekend with. And literally, you can play through it in a weekend, maybe a week tops. Dragon Quest Treasures, released on December 9th, 2022, and later in 2023 for the PC. With a user score of 7.5 and a meta score of 72, it wasn't necessarily the worst game under the sun, but more middle of the road. A lot of the complaints were the presentation of this game. On the Switch, it suffers from bad frame rate issues, and you hear the same 3-4 voice lines over and over. On top of that, the game is repetitive and a victim of RNG. You will go through the same areas over and over, following your radar until you uncover a treasure. As a huge fan of Dragon Quest, and as someone who just adored Dragon Quest XI, this was just fantastic to me. You play as Eric from Dragon Quest XI and his sister, and it's just one huge game of hide and seek. This is basically an action version of a Dragon Quest Monsters title, and while I mentioned it is very repetitive, the joy I personally got out of it came from the kind of treasures you could find. You can get all kinds of treasures referencing past games in the series, so as someone who has been playing Dragon Quest since he was more or less a baby, it just made me smile getting something like Kiefer's sword from Dragon Quest VII or a golden statue of Erdrich. Though, if I was going to suggest this game to anyone, I would suggest passing on the Nintendo Switch version, because while it works fine on the Switch, the fact that it caps at 30 frames per second and has frequent frame drops can easily kill the experience. If you play it on PC, it runs much better and feels incredibly smooth. I'll just say, it's the best game to play in short bursts on the Steam Deck, so if that's an option, you should really jump on it. If you go in just expecting a simple treasure hunt full of Dragon Quest nostalgia, you will have the time of your life. Definitely a game meant for longtime fans of the series. Forspoken, released for the PlayStation 5 on January 24th, 2023, and later for the PC. Forspoken has a user score of 4.1 and a meta score of 64. I'm gonna say this right now. I honestly feel like this game is one of those games that is a victim to review bombing. And I have to say, all of the bad press that this game has gotten has come from people who more than likely haven't even played the games themselves. One of the only real criticisms that I've heard about for Spoken is the dialogue and writing. Yes, the dialogue sounds like an edgy teenager trying to sound cool in a skate park, but honestly, with that being said, I personally really enjoyed the banter in this game. I hear complaints about the parkour being automatic and the open world being bland, but honestly, those seem like non-issues to me. Having to manually do parkour would turn the game into something like Mirror's Edge, and honestly, that didn't turn out very well at all. And open worlds? Well, boring open worlds are just all too common these days. So that's like complaining that Xenoblade has worlds that are too big or Grand Pulse in Final Fantasy XIII is too open. That's more of a personal thought though, you're free to dislike any part of the game that you want, but the gameplay of Forspoken is ridiculously fun, slinging spells left and right, and the story was also incredibly enjoyable. More people need to play this game because honestly, everyone I've talked to that actually played the game really enjoyed it save for the dialogue, which is totally fair. I feel like this game was unfairly judged. I haven't touched the DLC for it, but 
I just bought it for under five dollars, so I'm gonna jump into it very soon. Tales of Legendia, released on February 7th, 2006 for the PlayStation 2. With a user score of 7.9 and meta score of 72, this is another very divisive title. I've heard both sides of the coin with this game. There are some people that really like the game, and others that want to launch it into the sun by catapult. There are several complaints about this game, and I agree with every single one of them. Firstly, the combat is bland, and this is very true. I'm actually playing through the game right now for my upcoming review, and the combat is easily one of the weak points of the game. It's slow, and it feels incomplete. There's no Mystic Arts, though there are recorded voice lines for them. The movement is slow and sluggish, and every single boss can be beaten by just alternating long multi-hit moves between two characters. Another complaint is the dungeons. The encounter rate is frequent, and the dungeons are long for no reason at all, and you have to go through them multiple times throughout the course of the story. The biggest offender, in my opinion though, once you finish the first half of the game, the voice acting completely stops during the character quest portion of the game. There is no voice acting outside of battle in the skits. I have no idea why this happened, but it totally kills the motivation and enjoyment of the game. However, all this considered, I still really enjoy Tales of Legendia. I enjoy the game as a whole, the characters are fleshed out in a way that doesn't happen much in JRPGs since they all have their own dedicated chapter, and why they're on this adventure with you. The game is generally enjoyable even if it is one of the weaker games in the series, but it has one of the best stories and some of the best characters. Don't skip on Legendia, don't listen to all the critics, you'd be doing yourself a disservice. Final Fantasy VIII released on September 9th, 1999 for the PlayStation 1, and later on PC, Switch, PS4, and Xbox One. With a user score of 8.6 and a meta score of 90, this is probably the highest ranked game on my list, and I was really shocked that it scored that high. I don't know why, but generally, when Final Fantasy VIII is mentioned, it gets criticized to no end, some even saying that it's one of the worst games in the series. Be it the leveling system with monsters that level alongside you, the GF system, or even Triple Triad. That one is one I don't get. I love Triple Triad, and I often joke that Final Fantasy VIII is the best card game to ever exist. It even has an in-depth side quest where you get to save the world from sorceresses. But the biggest complaint I hear is the draw system, and I get it. You don't want to sit there and mash X for 10 minutes, getting 100 of a spell before you move on. It's cumbersome and seems like a waste of time. At least later on, you can use item refine or card refine to get spells without drawing, or with the HD remaster versions of the game, you can turn on times 3 speed and turn on cursor memory and just hold X for like 2 or 3 minutes and you'll have 100 spells in no time. With that being said, Final Fantasy VIII is actually among one of my top 3 Final Fantasy games, alongside Final Fantasy X-2 and the previously mentioned Final Fantasy XIII. I just love the whole romance concept being a main focus, even if it feels incredibly forced, as well as the game's soundtrack possibly one of the best soundtracks that the whole series has to offer. And another part might be a little bit nostalgia because Final Fantasy VIII was one of the first Final Fantasy games I ever played, so naturally I have a soft spot in my heart for it. This is one of those games that I play once every year or so because I enjoy it that much, and I'm sure we all have games like that. Do you have any of those games that you play over and over because you love them that much? So there you have it, 10 critically received games that I really enjoyed. Did I mention any games that you like or did I miss any? What games do you like that generally got bad reviews or get slandered online? Let me know in the comments below and hey, if you enjoyed this video and want more JRPG centric content, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and ding that notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. Speaking of videos, want to check out some of the games that I regret buying? I'm sure we all have some of those, so check this one out. Anyways, this has been Shinky. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, have a wonderful day.